Hi guys, we're down here at the Natural History Museum, nicknamed the Dead Zoo. We're going to go inside and meet curator Paolo Frascati, who's going to give us a little behind the scenes VIP tour. Let's go. Now, obviously given the times that are in it, we're going to be maintaining social distancing and being as careful as we can. So Paolo, tell me a little bit about what you have on the ground floor here. Well, the ground floor is the Irish room, so these are all the animals that you get um, in Ireland, really. Uh, there's a pretty good representation of anything you're likely to find. Um, there are some things which you're not going to stumble over, because, you know, obviously there are some things from the sea. Yeah. Um, so you, know, you only see that if you're out on a boat. And just speaking of the sea, I just couldn't help noticing over my right shoulder, there's an absolute ginormosaurus rex meg thing up there. What is it and where does it come from? I'm terrified of sharks, just so you know. This is, this is a basking shark. This one's from the west coast of Ireland. And, and they're, they're one of the larger animals you get around the coast. I mean, you do get whales. You get up to the size of a blue whale, which is the biggest animal on the planet. Do you mind taking me over here to have a look at some of the other stuff you have? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the good things about this, this kind of space is it's not just about animals that live in Ireland now. It's also got animals which used to be in Ireland. So around the walls, we have things like the giant Irish deer. Um, and we also have uh, things from caves. So, for example, this specimen here, this is one of my favourites. It's a, um, a hyena jaw down here. This, this is a hyena. This is an African hyena. This is a taxidermy specimen. But this here is the lower jaw of a hyena, which comes from a cave in Cork. So these were native to Cork? These were native to Ireland, yeah. You had these hyenas all over the place, um, all over Europe, coming into Ireland about 30,000 years ago. So it shows how, how Ireland has obviously changed. It's a constantly changing environment. It always has been, always will be. Um, and, you know, the climate changes. Um, now, in this case, it changes much more slowly than, you know, we, we talk about today. <laughs> but um, it's, it's something which has happened, and it's something where we have evidence for it in the, the form of these fossils. And, Paolo, you mentioned taxidermy earlier on. Am I to understand that this is actually a real animal? This isn't a model? Oh, absolutely. You know, these are real animals. So... Um, with taxidermy, you take the skin of the animal, and you know, usually these days we will have, you know, it would be roadkill or something like that, um, or maybe something dies in a zoo. Uh, historically, people would go out and shoot things, mm. and that was quite common. Uh, but generally speaking, you take the skin and you have a form on the inside, which is like a model, but then it's got a real skin pulled over it, and often there'll be real uh, bones inside sometimes, especially in the skull. Mm -hmm. So you can see the jaws or the beak on a bird or the claws and all those sorts of things. So they're real. That's That's very much a real animal. How do you preserve them here? So here we, um, we don't have an in-house taxidermist or anything, so if anything that gets taxidermied, um, anything new, will come in from external taxidermists mm -hmm. who, we will kind of, uh, who are often you know, actually very talented artists. So the specimen directly above your head um, is some, something which came in for this wonder cabinet um, about a year ago from uh, a taxidermist called Jasmine Miles Long, uh, and that is a um, peregrine falcon chasing a pigeon. It's an absolutely beautiful piece of taxidermy. Mm. Really, really well done, really sympathetically done, and um, obviously all ethically sourced specimens. The other sorts of specimens we tend to have a lot of are fluid specimens. They're very different. They, they tend to lose their colour. They tend not to be quite so um, vibrant. They don't look like they were alive because they are, you know, effectively pickles in jars. Um, but they take quite a lot of maintenance. So that's something I've been doing uh, while we're not open to the public. So we're on the first balcony up here. I haven't been up here since I was a kid. And it's, I just love coming here because it's the scale of the animals. Because you don't get a chance to see how big they are when you're looking at them on a screen or in a zoo. Um, tell us a little bit about what's over your shoulder. We've got a humpback whale and a fin whale. Yeah, so um, this is a fin whale. Sorry. That one's a fin whale, that one's a humpback whale. So this is a young humpback. They're a lot bigger than that when they get to full growth. Uh, the fin whale is actually a fairly decent sized one. That's about 20 meters long. And um, it's from uh, Bantry Bay. Uh, it washed up. It's one of these strandings. There's been um, whale strandings, an ongoing thing. We've been mm -hmm. documenting them through time. And Ireland's amazing because we're out there in the ocean, got the Atlantic around our side and the marine diversity is just incredible, absolutely Vast. fantastic. Mm. So we are one of, the, one of the best places in the world for people to come and do marine science. It's where huge numbers of really, really cool projects back in like the 19th century, the Victorians used to go out and try to explore the oceans and Ireland was, was a hub of that kind of activity because it's so well placed. Mm. This is really meant to represent 
the diversity of mammal life on the planet. Because, of course, this was all done, you know, the, the museum dates back to, well, it opened in 1857. Mm -hmm. And so... This was how people got to see what was in the world. There was no David Attenborough. There was no wildlife documentaries or, you know, there were no photographers going out and capturing wildlife or not in any meaningful or kind of good quality way. Yeah. Because the camera equipment wasn't good enough. But, I mean, even nowadays, like, where else are you going to get this close to what was once a walking hippo? Absolutely. You don't want to get that close to a living hippo. No, absolutely. You know, they're dangerous, dangerous animals. Yeah. Um, but here you get a chance to walk up right close to it. Please don't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can get really close to it and you can get a really good understanding of what's going on with its teeth, with its, with its you know, whole it's body, that thing. sense of scale and you know, even the thickness of the skin from the folds and all that. All of those sorts of things, it's really hard to get until you get up close. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's part of the reason why the collections are so, so fantastic. And, you know, I love bones, so that is, you know, things like the rhino there with the broken leg, just just seeing those sorts of features is just, you know, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, guys, we've had an absolutely fantastic time down here at the Dead Zoo. Whoops. I mean, the Natural History Museum. When you're down here standing beside these creatures, you really do get a feeling of the scale and the sheer size of them. It's absolutely fantastic. For the next few hours, I'm going to be comparing every single animal cartoon character I've ever seen to what they actually look like.